Welcome. Thanks for coming to my presentation. This project investigates the experience of members of the United Church of Canada who have found a second spiritual home in contemplative prayer groups, often ecumenical groups that include extended silent prayer, 20 minutes or more as part of a life of faith formation. Perhaps you're wondering why I gave the study the name Flying Fish. The image of the flying fish as a symbol of this group came out of a dream I had. In the dream, the fish, a symbol of the early Christians, and specifically this flying fish with their strange physique that allows them to leap and fly into the air, were an indication of their special engagement with another environment. Flying fish are creatures of water that occasionally leave their ordinary liquid environment to momentarily live in the air and then plunge back into the water. It seemed to me that participants who would live in two overlapping worlds in the church, one inside regular the United Church of Canada congregational life, and one based on the practice of contemplative prayer, leaping out of one to the other and then back into the one. I became interested in my own positives. Uh, I became interested because of my own positive experience with contemplative prayer in the forms of Christian meditation, John Main, and centering prayer, Thomas Keating. Finding it a great support to my spiritual life and not, and surprisingly, not a regular part of my experience at the United Church of Canada. I began to wonder what the experience was of others in a similar situation, why the practice appeared rarely and sporadically in congregations, and what the emergence of this parachurch, as one participant called it, meant for the evolution of the United Church of Canada. This is a phenomenological study that is based on the experience of the people in this group. And there were six who were given the names, the pseudonyms, Kim, Lilac, Marion, Jocelyn, Aaron, and Serenity. They came from across Canada and had a wide range of life experiences. There were six common themes around their experiences with contemplative prayer groups that emerged in this research. They form an arc of experience with contemplative prayer groups from their first instance with it to the present time. These were seeking, discovering, sharing, deepening, discouragement, and transformation. But before I talk about the research results, the things that happen in the foreground, it might help to quickly talk about the historical background so we can make sense of things later on. Everyone I interviewed was a member of the United Church of Canada, and the United Church of Canada is a Protestant church in the Reformed tradition. What does this mean? To answer that question, we need to go back 500 years. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther and Augustine Friar posted his 95 theses on the door of a church in Wittenberg's town square. The big issue was indulgences, something you could buy from the, United, from the Roman Catholic Church that would, for a fee, provide some relief to souls in purgatory. For Martin Luther, this was an abuse of power. It was a corruption of the church because it, lar it was largely a way to make money for the church. And it was a practice created by the church and not found in scripture. This conflict grew into what we know as the Protestant Reformation. If we jump ahead 200 years, we come to John Wesley, an Anglican, whose theology grew into Methodism, one of the foundation denominations of the United Church of Canada. At AST, we were introduced to the four main tenets of Methodism, called by some the Wesleyan quadrilateral, Scripture, 
reason, experience, and tradition. But once again, reason, experience, and tradition only as validated in scripture. Now we skip ahead to the 20th century, to the end of the 20th century, where the United Church of Canada publishes a, an official position paper called The Authority and Interpretation of Scripture. The preface of that position paper states this conviction. God calls us to engage the Bible as foundational authority as we seek to live the Christian life. So over 400 years, and this constant idea that the Bible is a foundational authority. This is important to remember. One of the first things that came out of the research was an awareness of the new opportunities that came out of the revolutionary social period of the 1960s. Joseph Campbell described it as an age of collisions. There were formerly horizons within which people lived and thought and mythologized. There are now no more horizons. And with the dissolution of horizons, we have experienced and are experiencing collisions, terrific collisions, not only of peoples, but also of their mythologies. This was intensified by what Marshall McLuhan called the global village. McLuhan says, today, after more, uh, after more than a century of electric technology, we have extended our central nervous system itself in a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is concerned. Ideas and concepts, both secular and religious, from all over the world flooded in. Yoga, Zen, Transcendental Meditation. As well, things were changing on the home front. Vatican II. This is where we join the participants in the study. The life of the holy orders of the Roman Catholic Church were now more accessible to the general public. Aaron says the presence of the contemplative tradition, even though it was mostly held in Roman Catholic monasteries and convents, was coming into the mainstream. And there's a strong social action presence of the spirit, changing the world in a rather strong and transformative kind of way. Encouraged by Vatican II, the writings of Trappist Thomas Merton on the monastic life found a much larger audience. And there was a renewed interest in the contemplative practices, such as the Ignatian exercises. In the 1970s, and also encouraged by Vatican II, came the development of Christian meditation by Dominican John Main in England and Centering Prayer by Trappist Thomas Keating and other monks at St. Joseph's Abbey in Spencer, Massachusetts. Father Keating tells the story about a small group coming to the abbey looking for directions to a Buddhist meditation retreat and aware of the Christian contemplative tradition and seeing the need, decided to work to make it more available to the general public. This is reflected in one of Aaron's observations. What was very interesting is most of the people that were in the Shambhala community had to come out of an experience of Christian community that wasn't satisfying. It wasn't meeting their needs. So they ended up in Buddhism and the fault is ours. The Christian uh, tradition allowed this expression of the spirit to be cloistered. The first theme that emerged from my research is seeking. As they started out, the experience of the desert was pronounced for most of the, their participants. And again, I was in my settlement charge in the Gaspé and it was desert-like, a place without. I'm not very good at feeling inadequate and I guess that I am by nature self-observing and that I knew that it didn't feel real and people kept talking about it, that it's prayer and that you're supposed to do it. And I couldn't do it. 
what was happening with that? The next theme to emerge was discovery. Most of the participants came into contact with one of these forms of contemplative practice by accident. It was like coming upon an oasis and they were really surprised and delighted. And oh my goodness, this exists. And obviously there was something in me that knew about this, but I had never had any sense that it existed as a tradition that was rich and full and within Christianity. The Marian, the first time I went to a, on a silent retreat and I loved it so much that I didn't want it to end. And so driving back home, I turned off the radio in my car. I haven't turned it back on ever. One of my favorite quotes. Yet as soon, almost as soon as they found it, they became excited to share with others with an evangelical zeal. So I guess I jumped in with both feet. I practiced for a bit, you know, supported a group meet, and then we started our own practice group. Once the practice started, an intuitive exploring started, but without a great deal of explanation. Meditation is like focusing on your breathing, just relaxing. Like if I did meditation, I would be doing contemplation. There was something special about scripture that is not there in poetry or prose. Like you can contemplate a poem, but to me, scripture is something special that I think that is coming from inside of us and how you relate to it. Jocelyn. Uh, trying to find out who I am, why I am, why am I here? How am I in relationship to God? I'm looking for something bigger, a unity with that, with the holy. An intuitive awareness of the larger prayer tradition, as ex explained by Thomas Merton, seems to be present. Meditatio, meditation. Psalmodia, the singing of psalms. Lectio, scripture. Oratio, public prayers. And contemplatio, contemplation. For Merton, this is part of a continuous whole, the entire unified life of the monk. Conversatio monastica, his turning from the world to God. The prayers were all one um, part of one unified whole. And we can relate to this in the United Church of Canada because we have many of these prayers in our order of service. The gathering, Natasha, the gathering together to the center. Confession, penance, which of course in the Roman Catholic Church is a sacrament but for us it is not. The prayers of the people, oratio, the scripture, lectio, and the hymns, samodia. And the Lord's Prayer, which we have in almost all of our services, which is a model for what it is to pray. Um, it was given in response to the Apostles request, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. We have this prayer. One participant, Aaron, who had decades as a United Church of Canada minister, helped me to see the way that contemplative prayer works in concert with other forms of prayer and get me over the bias that contemplative prayer was not special, but complimentary. Here he says, contemplative prayer has given depth and breadth to prayer as I understood it earlier in my life, and that prayer is indeed a large area of inquiry. It's not just one or two words to say, a word before you go to bed or in a pulpit on Sunday. It's a way of being prayerful. You know it's integrated and it's integrative. One of the questions that I asked was 
contemplative prayer has never been part of the United Church of Canada. What does this mean for you? And there was this tone of discouragement at this. They responded, there is a sadness about that. Uh, there's a, a sadness about that because it's such a rich tradition. And I believe there are many people who would respond to it positively if it was being offered, Aaron. It's a disappointment, but the philosophy of the United Church, the social consciousness, et cetera, is something I guess I like, serenity. We almost feel as if we are doing this clandestine thing on the side and begging for space, Jocelyn. Let's take a step back. It wouldn't be fair to look at these experiences without dealing with critical issues that have been uh, that have arisen around contemplative prayer practices. Let's look at three of them. Is our contemplative prayer practices elitist? There are no readily available statistics available for the exact groups I was looking at, but there is a 2015 study on the sociodemographic barriers around engagement in mindfulness practices by US adults which included more than 69,000 people. And if we look at the 5,000 of that group who meditated, 70% had higher than high school education and a higher income. And I see this demographic in every contemplative prayer group I have attended as well. Although uh, this may be related to the need for the availability of time to practice and the present luxury that time has become in our society, Awareness of this fact should help us to stay awake to the reality of this practice. It is not an escape from the unpleasantness of the world, but an invitation to care for it more deeply. Another student in the program I am taking at AST has been involved in Christian meditation for a decade, but recently has taken another critical look at the scripture used to support it. In John Main's book, Moment of Christ, Main refers to John 10.10, 10, I have come that men may have life and have it in all its fullness. Main connects this in terms of union with God and states that this being open to life source, that is God through meditation, is what Jesus proclaims in this passage. In the context of scriptural passages around it, where Jesus speaks about his crucifixion and the salvation in that act, this passage, as used by John Main, seems taken out of scriptural framework. This does not invalidate it, but shows there are many ways to interpret this passage. Augustine at the start of this confession states that we have a telos, an end goal in our lives. God, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find the rest in you, end quote. The promise of contemplative prayer is this transcendental awareness, this resting in God. In a short study on the benefits of centering prayer on psycho-spiritual outcomes, there was some frustration that the expectation of transcendental awareness as an outcome was replaced by the awareness of difficult emotions. It is important to keep in mind that there's, this was only a six week study, but unrealistic expectations of jumping to the end was there. As well as issues, of course, there were opportunities identified in this study. Let's look at three. In an upcoming book called Visioning New and Minority Religions, Eugene B. Gallagher, who is a Rosemary Park Professor Emeritus of Religious Studies and a specialist in new religious movements, talks about practice-oriented spiritualities. We seek to balance dwelling-oriented approach, that is collectivity, tradition, stability, with seeking-oriented approach. That is negotiation, individuality, and a personal journey. Gallagher identifies these practice oriented spiritual as part of a growing trend. Contemplative prayer groups are a practice oriented spirituality. Don't worry, Martin Luther. 
There is scriptural support for including silent practice, including Sabbath and listening for the still small voice of God. All participants agree that making space for silent prayer is not just having an empty room available, but becoming intentional in the practice and having trained leaders. It is taught and sought. It is taught and caught. I think one of the um, most important opportunities that we have discovered in this research is that a, a few uh, participants felt inadequate when the subject of prayer came up. Lalek said, people kept talking about prayer and you're supposed to do it, and I couldn't do it. She didn't know how to pray. The disconnection between prayer at the United Church of Canada and prayer in contemplative prayer groups seemed to reveal a lack of understanding of the life of prayer as a whole process. Aaron, a retired minister, mentioned that prayer was not taught when he was at school in, in the 1970s, and my experience was the same. We're taught how to write prayers, but the understanding of what prayer is was assumed. Teaching prayer as part of our school and church life would help to relieve this lack of understanding concerning a central activity of our spiritual life. So we come to the last of the, the six themes. What was the value that people in the study gave to their participation in the contemplative prayer groups? How did it transform them? I went on feeling more centered as a human being and made a connection to, well, I guess the universe. That is in part how I, in my own mind, identify God. Marion said the contemplative prayer group was my door into faith and certainly my door into ministry. So what have we learned through this study? First, that we are called to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. And that requires a whole suite of active and contemplative processes working together. Secondly, that meditation and silence are part of the necessary parts of prayer. This is especially true during a time where the age of collision has reached into our lives, where our attention is, is now a commercial commodity where fear and desire continually shout at us and, and tempt us from nearly every screen 24-7. We come to the growing awareness that the only real freedom is to rest in the reality of God and have faith, especially faith that seeks understanding. Finally, that all parts of our prayer life, properly ordered, inform each other and deepen our relationship with God. As Aaron says, it's integrated and it's integrative participatory, and homemaking. Thanks to the people who came out tonight and those who volunteered to take part in this research. I find your sanity and good heartedness kindles hope and faith in this sometimes crazy world where the idea that we are living in a post-truth era dilutes our sense of that underlying reality that for many diminishes us all. Thanks to my family for their ongoing support providing refreshments tonight. May this work, as far as it indicates the reality of the love of God, help us to uh, help to inspire faith and hope in all who need it. Amen. The scripture, you know, the one that came to mind was uh, uh, go into the room in your heart. Yes, the Ephesians. Yeah, and it seems to me it's just right there. That's what you're doing in Sunday prayer. We see. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree to you uh, with you. Of course, you know, Keating talked about the fact that in these simple houses there was no rooms. So what room were they talking about? <laughs> How could there possibly be a room? There were just the four walls, and that's where everyone was. So the sense of privacy. So he said it had to be some kind of symbolic approach, and that was uh, um, certainly uh, something that I could see. Um, the experience uh, of coming back from a place, having the authentic experience, 
when you, when you have that sense of the presence of God and you come back and talk to somebody else about that, that's kind of coming from inside out. You know, it's like someone going down, you're going to Toronto, you've never been to Toronto, and, and you meet all these people coming back from Toronto and saying, oh, these big buildings and these fantastic things in the Toronto, and you get an idea of what's going on, but it's like a menu. You haven't got to the meal yet. And these people have gone, they've had the meal, they've had communion, they've had that sense of connection, and they're coming back and they're talking to you, and it's really exciting, because they've been there, and they, they, they know they've been there, and they, they have that sense of coming back, and the authentic feeling that you get, the, the sincerity, the sincerity, the, I say, that sense of sameness, it's just, I've done it, so here it is. And when I hear uh, all the forces, it reminds me of, of course, that sense of passage where they said, when they listened to Jesus, he didn't speak like the other people, he spoke with a sense of authority. And you think, that, that's what it is. I mean, I'm not saying these people are Jesus, I'm just saying that they have the same sense of, these people are genuine and sincere, and, and they're talking from their own experience of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, they can couch it in theological language, but there's that sense. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Um, so when it comes to that, the sense of being in the door and closing the door and bolting the door, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, it reminds me of the, 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 those, those poor people sitting around in, in, in that, the, that room at uh, Emmaus, and they, they close the door and say, who should turn out for dinner, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, absolutely, it, it does. You have to close these things down and say, we have this sense of media coming in on us all the time from every direction. You know, that we really feel um, that we almost don't have our own minds anymore. We can't even get at our own selves. There's so much between us and our perceptions and, and, our, and the sense of ourselves. There's uh, so many uh, distractions, so many possibilities, so many ideas, so many concepts, layers and layers and layers, and it takes a long time. We need to go to that quiet place. We need to shut the doors on that media and say, it's just me and you, God, in that space, in the quiet. Well, I think in a, in a spiritual group or a Bible study group, it happens naturally. Yes. Well, we learned in school yes. when I was a child that if you have uh, less and less, I don't know, in the public schools, I guess they don't. You know? My upbringing was such that, you know, Catholic school, church, yeah. we learned how to pray. Well, I, I think, you know, there are people in the media are making lots of money dealing with spiritual development. Like I have a friend who I share with, uh, I'm an existentialist, I didn't expect to meet another existentialist in town, but I did. But then we discuss spiritual books and gurus, and he has uh, lectures by Tal, T-O-L-L-E, yeah. who went through a very difficult experience and come out with a very spiritual outlook that I, I find his lectures extremely uh, inspiring. And then there's somebody on PBS, I forget his name, but I have some of his books. But he also deals with this. Uh, and I can't for the life of me understand why my own church that comes from Methodism and Presbyterianism and be so sterile with regard to what we're talking about, with our own spiritual development. And when I read the United Church Observer, it could be an NDP journal or just a nice <laughs> secular magazine. There used to be a minister in Carp would have a, Anglican would have a spiritual part in it. But you know, Edgerton Ryerson, who's getting such a bad press nowadays, who was uh, editor of the Methodist paper, which was, uh, according to a professor I was talking to, was the most important newspaper in Upper Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a, a great, and of course Ryerson Press was named after Edgerton Ryerson, and now they're getting after him because he wasn't good to the natives. But uh, I think there has been this uh, 
of spirituality and meetings to share it as a part of uh, the United Church. My father was a minister for years, and he always had Bible studies. Yes. And I think if we're just going to church on Sunday, you now I, I say to my wife that our church is too noisy. And she, and she said, and I, she said, and I said, well, there are other two churches in town that are not as noisy, but I really like our church because yeah. of its friendliness. But we worshipped as part of an Anglican church in India, and every Sunday we'd have the 95th Psalm of the 90th, and, and the 100th the Jubilate. Yeah. And I thought they were great, you know, they're just sheer worship. Mm -hmm. And they are repetitive, but we create a new prayer every Sunday, and uh, I, I don't, I don't think we have a prayer of confession very much, which I think is good for the soul. And I, I think a lot of our religion is secularism, where we're trying to fix the problems of the world. Yeah. And I don't think we're likely to fix them, although it's good to try. But I, but I do feel that the, the transcendent dimension is forgotten in our church and in our society. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are gurus who are, who are doing very well spreading mm -hmm. a spiritual approach to life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, mm. I, I do think that there's this element that we're kind of losing ourselves, losing a sense of it. And I think some of the Bible study helps you to reflect in terms of who you are in, in, the, uh, in the story and what's going on in the story. Um, that we, we find ourselves so busy that we kind of lose ourselves in, in this process. And, and something like a Bible study, like a quiet time in a small community, I think really does help. And, and perhaps it's these small groups like what we have for the prayer group, a small group of people. Setting aside an hour and a half or so uh, helps you to get back to the sense. And, and I don't know whether there is a, a form of the Bible study that would, would, would do that right now. I don't know, if, can, we, can we go back? Can we go to this form that, that people seem to be uncomfortable? I don't know why. Maybe they don't feel like they have enough time. Life is too busy. Well, when I was an Almonte's pastor, yes. we had a Bible study, and then my wife had a Bible study in the Mass. Ah. And she said, you know, your Bible study is talking all about ideas. Yes. Our Bible study is talking about our needs. Yeah. So there are different types of Bible study. Mm. She said we needed a man's group. Yeah. And I said, why do we need a man's group? We can meet at Tim Hortons and insult one another and talk about <laughs> hockey. <laughs> well, we have a men's group now, but men don't talk about their needs. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm reminded by of the joke that there's a very small difference between a sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you'd like to go on the